Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to the Mic Check Podcast. This is T-Word, the People's Champ. Thanks for joining. Today, we're going to talk about a little bit of boxing. But before we do, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Check out some of the other videos on this channel. There'll be some suggestions at the end, as well as a little thumb mark about halfway through the video for you to check out a playlist called Ringside, which is our collection of boxing-related videos. I'll make it easy for you to find the content that you're looking for on this channel. Also, don't forget to vote on a poll that we have live on our community tab. We'd we'll love to get your input. We're trying to figure out uh, what you're here for. You know, are you here for boxing? football, basketball, something else, or just something non-sports related at all, we love to know because we are going to be providing a lot of different content over the time that this channel is up and available, and we're looking to grow and expand our audience by making sure we provide the content that you're interested in seeing. So, this weekend has arrived, and January 7th, 2023, we're looking at a massive Premier Boxing Champions card, um, going to be a pay-per-view event, however, there's an opportunity to see some under undercard fights um, on the YouTube stream. And then there's even an untelevised portion that'll take place before that. So if you're in the DC area and it's a pretty hot ticket right now, you're looking at something like nine fights um, that you're gonna be able to check out. There's four on the main card. There's three on the YouTube stream undercard. And then there's three fights before that. So actually we're looking at about 10. So it's going to be a great day of boxing. Um, unfortunately, Tom's not going to allow me to really dig in on every single fight, even though I've been kind of checking out all the different fighters on the card. Uh, Mia, they call her the Killer Bee. She's on the early card. Um, Jaleel Hackett's fighting. So there's a lot of there's a lot of young prospects that are going to be on. But unlike Top Rank, where they show you the prospects, uh, BBC tends to hide them until they make some noise and build a following. But today, we're just going to go ahead and spend a little time discussing the theater of boxing because nobody's fought yet, you know. So we're just going to talk about all the things surrounding the fights that are coming up, including the press conference that took place on Thursday and then the weigh-in that took place on Friday. And then also talk about some of the uh, interviews that were picked up by different platforms such as Fight Hype, Fight Hub, The Port Away Podcast, uh, Ellie Setback, uh, ES News, etc. Um, and even Dante's Boxing Nation. So um, a lot of their correspondents were able to grab fighters and trainers and different people around the industry to get their take on what they thought of the fights this weekend, as well as maybe what their particular fighter or the fighters themselves were doing. So I want to start with the press conference, which took place on Thursday. And if you hadn't noticed, typically you have the A side, B side seating. So on the A side, which was the left side of the TV screen, uh, you had Demetrius Andrade, you had Rashidi Ellis, you had Javon Ennis, and that was just the undercard, the main undercard press conference. Uh, Javante Davis and Hector Luis Garcia had their own press conference that was separate. On the right side of the uh, display on the undercard press conference, you had uh, Karen Chukazan, or Chukajan, I'm sorry. I really just got the pronunciation. I listened to Brian Custer so I could nail it, and he got it. It's right. So um, Chupa John was on that side. Uh, you have Ramon Villa on that side as well. And then finally at the table, you had Demar Nicholson. And you could just pair them up. Obviously, Chupa John uh, and Ennis, um, Villa and Ellis, Nicholson and Andrade. I believe those are going to be a matchup. So they started off with Hugo um, at the far end of the table. And he was talking to BC about just, just different elements of getting ready to fight. And sometimes what they tend to do with these fighters is even though their opponent is sitting across the stage from them, they'll talk to them about what's coming up down the road instead of really focusing on the fight. Now, the main event fighters, they don't typically get too much because these are usually big, somewhat even fights, but some of these undercard fights are a bit lopsided, so they really focus on that ace hype and what they're going to do next. And that was the tone of this particular interaction, and then they shift the focus to Demond Nicholson, and he let him know, he made it very clear. He was like, man, F. Charlo and all that other stuff. He has no interest in talking about what's next. He got to fight me first. He definitely let Andrade know that you got to fight on your hands, man. So, you know, if you bought that action, let's get it. So they have a nice little back and forth. Actually made me a little bit more hyped about the fight because I don't know a whole lot about the Mon Nicholson. I know he's had a good fight. But um, just in the context of him fighting an elite fighter like uh, Demetrius Andrade, I just wasn't sure that this was going to be a really good matchup, 
but it's a little bit less lopsided than I expected. And his energy let me know that he's coming to fight. He's not coming to lay down and allow somebody to kick his ass for fun. You know what I mean? So um, I, I think it added some hype. And I get that's what the that's what the press conference is for, right? You know, this is part of the theater. You've got to sell the fight. And I thought that they did a good job of selling their matchup to make everybody who might not have been interested in sitting in front of the TV at nine o'clock Eastern, eight o'clock Central, they're going to be sitting in front of the TV because they want to see them twos get at it. And see them two dudes get at it because it seemed like it was some stuff going on. Now, now we're going to talk about the win in a minute, but it might just wage your opinion a little bit about the fight if you saw the win as well. Um, I like to watch the win because I want to see what shape the fighters are in. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But anyway, so moving down the table, we get to Rishi Ellis, and he's got a live dog at Thea, even though I still think that the skill set of Ellis is going to be enough to offset the immense power of Thea, who has 24 wins and 22 KOs. He's up there with Tank. You get in the ring with him, you go in the sleep or you lose it. Or you'll get that one decision that he had. Um, I just don't know that a flat footed fighter like that is going to be able to do what's necessary when you have somebody that could move, change angles. Ellis actually fought at 154, so he's a big 147. So you're looking at, even if he's not taller in stature, he's naturally the bigger guy, big, dense, big, dense muscle, which is going to make it something that needs to become. That means that he has a little bit of power. Now, he's not a knockout artist, but that doesn't mean his punch don't hurt. Um, everybody that punches hard doesn't necessarily possess the technique required to get KOs on a regular basis. And Ellis could be one of those guys. And if he's not only 147 after filling out to 54, if I never for a little bit, he may be leaving some power in the gym. So I just think from that perspective, I just don't know how this is going to play out. But their interaction took a back seat to um, you had Ellis and then Ennis sitting right next to each other. These are two welterweights that are going to fight back to back on the undercard. So you start to see Brian Custer kind of instigate a little bit, which he's really good at. You got to give BC his credit, man. But um, he starts to instigate a little bit, and he's like, hey, you know, Ellis, if you win, you got a guy sitting next to you. If he wins, is there a showdown in the future? And obviously, those dudes want to scrap. Now, something that was weird is their interaction was, you could tell they're not real, real, real talkers, but Boots had that let's go energy, and I felt like he came to the press conference with that because after the press conference, he sat down with uh, Sean Porter, and he had a lot of the same energy, like, it's whatever. Like, he'll he'll get in the ring, and he'll do whatever with whoever, and he don't care who has something to say about it. So when they were asked about it, Boots immediately says, let's go. And Ellis was more reserved about it, more conversational. And he really didn't have that hype. I mean, maybe because he's a little bit older than Boots, he understood not to get in his energy and focus on a guy that he's not fighting yet when he really needs to keep his energy focused on the opponent coming up, who's obviously a big puncher. So I can understand maybe why he wasn't as vocal um, or energetic about let's do it now. Um, they did bring up some things that maybe weren't available to the public. For example, Ellis was saying that an offer was made to him by the Ennis team, but it wasn't enough, um, even though it was double what he's making the fight be. And that kind of tells you the level of where he ranks fighting boots versus his actual opponent tonight. Um, I don't think he respects me enough to think that that dude's going to be a real challenge for him. <laughs> but he respects him enough to not get in there and play around either and remain focused on making the main thing the main thing. Um, so their little banter was cool. Um, feels like they're they're building something. And one guy Showtime, the other guy Showtime PBC. So the fight's definitely within the realm of possibility. Um, and I think they just started marinating it with that little press conference. I think their post-fight in-ring conversations are going to be critical. And I also think that their post-fight press conference is going to be very critical to determine if this happens next. They both expressed that, hey, we probably can't get the champions right now. So whoever's out there that wants to smoke, we can get it. And I can see that being a thing. And I'm, I'm thinking, I, I want to see them cook the fight a little bit because I don't want it to go on, you know, just on a small audience. I want to see it on the big stage and give them both an opportunity to make some real money on pay-per-view. But they need to cook it and sear it on both sides and get it out there on the plate by the end of 2024 or it's going to lose steam because they're not they're not going to gain star status enough, in my opinion, equally to make this a big fight like Spence Crawford 
could potentially be. So I think it's going to cook to a boiling point um, by the end of next year. So I think summer 24, they could definitely do it. If they don't get it done this year, I just think it might need to, they might need to beat somebody up and then beat a couple other people up and then get in the ring and that might work. Um, moving on down the table, Jerron Ennis, um, he has Karen Chukajan on the table in the IBF, in the IBF interim title fight, um, which is going to align him to fight Errol Spence. Oh, man. Um, Boots looks ready. He looked like he, he for the BS, like, <laughs> and I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, like, Buddy showed up. I mean, he came in like, hey, I'm here. I know what I got to do. And whoever wanted can get it. There's not much more to say about that. Obviously, there's a language barrier with some of the guys on the other side of the uh, press conference table. So there's not there's not a lot of banter between the opponents as much as the American guys were bantering. So that kind of limited. Um, I'm not a big fan of the press conferences where it goes through the translator and back and forth. It just it kind of disjoints things. So it's not that interesting of a watch. But I still tune in anyway because you never know what happened. For example. The Andrade interaction with Nicholson, the Ellison Ennis interaction, you'll miss that if you don't watch. Now, moving on to the uh, the weigh-in, and I'm going to go ahead and wrap this video up here shortly. Um, the weigh-in was interesting because, man, Tank looked, uh, he, he looked kind of small. And I don't know if Hector's just, just a big dude, you know, dense muscle. But Hank didn't look, Tank didn't look that big. He looked like he was kind of drawn in a little bit. Um and before I get to that, I'm sorry. Uh, Tank's part of the press conference. He came out later, and uh, <laughs> he basically was very thankful to the Floyd Mayweather. Uh, his coach spoke, spoke passionately about being ready for the fight. And they actually said that they felt a little bit uh, disrespected that people weren't giving him his credit. Now, I mean, he does have a couple full championships at 130, but then he's got the regular belts at uh, 35 and 40, so he doesn't always get full credit for that even though he did win those championships in the ring. He took those regular belts off people, not vacant titles or anything like that. Um, he actually won one of his belts as a vacant title. So think about that. You know what I'm saying? He gets more credit for a title he didn't even be the champion for. But anyway, that's beside the point. We'll talk about that later. Um, they were just kind of talking about the disrespect. And the coach for um, Hector Luis Garcia, he was like, no, we ranked tank as a pound for pound fighter they're coming in very respectful and i don't know how hector's going to translate that in the ring i don't know if he's going to be a little hesitant to engage and he might try to use footwork which he doesn't really have i don't know how this is going to go but the, the back and forth just it was a high level of respect from hector's side and it was like just a tone of like let's get to the fight because we were ready to show some people some stuff tank looks like he's ready to let out some frustrations over his recent legal issues so hey man this is gonna be a hell of a main event and i think tank is coming to put on the show i do have a prediction video coming up later on today but right now we just kind of want to discuss the theater of boxing you know just get that off my chest all right so back to the way so tank looked really small to me uh and somebody else that didn't look um as filled out as he typically does as the way it boots looked a little lean too and he came in at almost two pounds underweight, I think he was like 145.5 or something like that, uh, of the 147 weight limit. So he was like, he said he weighed on the scale early in the day at 146.6, but for some reason he was a full pound less. So I don't know if his scale was off or that scale at the weigh-in, everybody seems to, seem to be about a pound off weight, which is kind of high. They're usually a few ounces or a half a pound or whatever. Um, something just wasn't right about that scale. Uh, the sanctioning bodies don't say nothing. There's there's really no belts on the line besides tanks. So I guess they're not that concerned. They usually give a pound sometime. But um, we'll see how that plays out. I think the guys are mostly all going to be able to rehydrate about 10% of the body weight. So for most of these guys, that's anywhere from 12 to 168. That's going to be 12 to 17 pounds. 168 pound division. It looks like about a 16.8 pound um ability to uh, rehydrate basically 10 percent. so we'll see how that plays out for all these different fighters on the card. uh ultimately um whatever they fill out as i think they'll be okay it's just i thought tank and, and uh boobs looked a little bit light 
Uh, they looked a little lean, I guess you could say, but we'll see how it goes. Um, I still think they're going to be okay for the fight. Uh, they've recently both been really good with weight. Uh, you just expect that Boots is going to come in looking a little buff on the scale uh, because he's a big lot weight, so we'll see how that goes. But for the most part, everything looks online. We've got a lot of great fights. Everybody made their weights. Everybody looks like, you know, they took their, their camp seriously. They look focused and ready to go ahead and put on a great performance and make it worth your $75 on pay-per-view. Again, we're going to come back later with our prediction video. It's going to be much shorter than this one. I just wanted to talk about some of the high range stuff um, that sometimes gets overlooked. I know not every fan is interested. So, so that's why I want to separate from something that those really in-depth fans care about and then separate it from the prediction, which is something that more the betting fans and the people that just care about the fights. Um, I think that there's two audiences that play that. And you know, I'm, I'm interested in both, oh, so I just felt like two videos might be better. So, go ahead and stay tuned, turn on those notifications, check it out. This is T Word, my check podcast. Like, comment, and subscribe. Give your comments down there and tell us what you think about this particular discussion. And until later, we'll see y'all like the fights. Peace.